Welcome to another edition of Horse Center, everyone. I am Brian Zipsy, and as always, I have the super pleasure of being joined by my co-host to the East Coast. That's Matt Shipman. How are you today, Matt? I am good, Brian. Back in New Jersey, as our regular viewers can tell. Yeah, there you go, Matt. We had a good time out there at Saratoga together, and of course, we called it the race of the year going in. I don't think the Travers disappointed. What a race. Absolutely, Brian. I don't think it disappointed in any way at all. The the top horses did what they were supposed to do. It came down to a head at the end. Uh, um, boy, I'd like to see the race again. Let's go ahead and roll that race, Matt Shipman. They're in the gate. in the DraftKings Travers, and it was a beautiful beginning. And a quick one for Batten down, Torpedo Anna along the inside, and Dornick is headstrong up and on the pace once again. Fierceness settles beautifully in fourth. Unmatched Wisdom is fifth, followed by Honor Marie racing on the outside of Corporate Power, and Sierra Leone is eight lengths off Batten down, who's in control early. Opening up to lead it by two. Dornick in a nice tracking position. Second, Torpedo Anna tucked in on the fence. Third, Fierceness fourth with three and a half to make up. The opening quarter went in 23 and two-fifths seconds. Unmatched Wisdom is a bit of a handful. He wants to be closer. He's off the pace today, four and a half lengths off the speed. Honor Marie is three deep as they make their way onto the backstretch. Corporate power in between horses and Sierra Leone is inside of that pair, and in fact, now in front of both of them. Batten down, leads the way by a length over Dornick, with fierceness in the clear third. Torpedo Anna, patiently handled in fourth, three and a half off the pace. The half went in a very reasonable 48 seconds flat. Behind them, unmatched wisdom. Sierra Leone has six lengths to make up, three in front of corporate power, and Honor Marie. Dornick coming at Batten down now. They're on even terms with Fierceness looming three wide. Torpedo Anna is four, just two and a half lengths off the pace. And Sierra Leone is revving up fifth. He's four lengths off the new leader, Fierceness. Three quarters in 111 and three. They're at the top of the stretch and Fierceness takes command. Sierra Leone is coming with his run on the outside of Torpedo Anna, who's currently second. They're in the final furlong. Johnny V asking Fierceness for everything he has. Three length lead. Torpedo Anna running her heart out and coming with every stride. Fierceness, Torpedo Anna in an absolutely dramatic conclusion. The champ is back. Fierceness holds off a gallant torpedo Anna to win the DraftKings Travers. Sierra Leone was third. Wow. Matt, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think we could have asked for a better race. I, I think this was the race of the year going in, like we said, and I think it will stand up as the race of the year. Uh, the four, the top four, the four big favorites of the bunch certainly ran. They distanced themselves from the rest. Uh, fierceness, the champ is back, as uh, uh, announcer Frank Miramati said. Um, I don't know if he ever left. He just wasn't able to string two big races together in a row before, and he did this time coming off the Jim Dandy, now three for three at Saratoga. Yeah, Brian, you know, still get a little bit of chills watching that, even though I've seen it uh, as many times as as uh, as we've mentioned. Uh, yeah, fierceness, um, putting two big races together. I think, uh, I think we said heading into this race, maybe – Fierceness had begun to mature following uh, uh, his performance in the Jim Dandy. It sure seems that way. But I'll tell you, Brian, not only was Fierceness and Torpedo Anna the stories, but I think a big story of the race was the ride that Fierceness got from Hall of Famer Johnny Velasquez. Yeah, Velasquez. Is there a better big race rider than Johnny Velasquez these days? The veteran uh, there who's won so many times at Saratoga. Re uh, a beautiful race. Uh, Miramati even said early, it, the first time around, 
that uh, fierceness was just relaxed in fourth early. Uh, he did a great job of uh, moving up into third on the backstretch, which basically kept uh, Hernandez and Torpedo Anna on the rail. Torpedo Anna had to uh, find room. It didn't open up for her on the inside. So Hernandez definitely moved her to the outside. She didn't lose much, but Fierceness got the jump on her. And that may have been the difference considering how small a margin it was at the end. Great ride by Velasquez. Fierceness moves to the top spot among the three-year-olds passing doorknock. They both have two grade one wins and a grade two win this year. But I think the Travers trumps uh, uh, even the Belmont. So fierceness moves up. Torpedo Anna, though, I'll tell you what, Matt, this, this sensational three-year-old filly uh, for trainer Kenny McPeak uh, loses nothing in this defeat. In fact, I think her stature only rises with her absolutely sensational uh, race here. Uh, it'll be back to the Phillies for Torpedo Anna, but uh, boy, did she run a big race. She sure did, Brian. And you know, I I, I noticed something different uh, when we were when I was watching the replay with uh, with the Horse Center fans in this show. I'll tell you, uh, yes, Torpedo Anna came running. Yes, she just missed by a nose. But you know what? Sierra Le Sierra Leone was making his move, but Torpedo Anna kept Sierra Leone at bay. Uh, Sierra Leone could not really uh, cut the margin very much at all on the Philly. Yeah, yeah. Great performance by Fierceness. Great performance by Torpedo Anna. Let's talk about Sierra Leone a little bit. You know, everybody's down on him. He was the favorite, which surprised me uh, in this race. I think people expected a faster pace, and certainly that probably helps his late run more. So it didn't set up as well as I think a lot of people thought it would for Sierra Leone, but he still ran another big race. He's lost four in a row. He keeps running good races while losing those four in a row. The last three have come at Saratoga. Maybe Sierra Leone just would prefer a different racetrack, but I think a faster pace would have helped as well. Yeah, I, maybe that is true about Sierra Leone and uh, the Saratoga uh, racetrack. But I think in our Travers preview show, you and I both said uh, uh, there's going to be some pace, but maybe we don't really expect that it's going to be a hot pace. And that was the case. Yeah, 48 flat for the half mile, battened down on the lead. It allowed other horses to relax. One horse I don't think, unfortunately, relaxed, at least real early in the race, was Doorknock. It looked like Doorknock was the one that wanted to go. Torpedo Anna and uh, Fierceness were able to relax for their riders going into the first turn. Doorknock looked just a little bit more eager to go after batten down early, and Saez had to hold them back a little bit. You know, he was a well-beaten fourth here. I'm not making a huge excuse for Doorknock, but uh, he was the one who fought his rider just a little bit going into that first turn. He's still very much in the race for three-year-old champion, Matt. It should come down to the Breeders' Cup Classic. We expect all three of these excellent three-year-olds to be in the Breeders' Cup Classic as their next race, and a championship will be decided. But fierceness with the win in the Travers moves up as the uh, as the leader of the division. Torpedo Anna has already locked up that three-year-old Philly division, Matt. Yeah, for sure. And and heading into the Breeders' Cup Classic, I, I mean, where these three-year-olds are going to face older horses. And we'll talk about some of those late uh, as we move on in the show. But my feeling is that heading into the Classic, the three-year-olds are the horses to beat. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'd agree with that. I mean, the older horses, yeah, they're a little bit of a mess uh, we're going to talk about the older horses here now. The older horses are a little bit of a mess right now, but uh, we could have uh, one or two step up this weekend. We also have some internationals coming. Maybe if you include the three-year-old internationals, uh, I'll, I'll jump on that bandwagon with you. But I think this classic looks pretty wide open to me. Speaking of the Breeders' Cup Classic, let's talk about two key races heading into the Breeders' Cup Classic. Now it'll be nine weeks away. First one we're going to do is on track at Del Mar, where the Breeders' Cup will be run, of course. It's the Pacific Classic, Matt. They drew a field of nine, and, and I think I think there's a lot of horses in here that we would not even consider for the Breeders' Cup Classic. But there are a few interesting horses in this race. We got to start with number seven, Adair Manor. Adair Manor has absolutely been a terrific mare uh, most of her career. She's 10 of 18 lifetime, multiple graded stakes winner, in fact, she comes into this 
the Pacific Classic off three romping graded stakes wins in a row. Yep, graded stakes wins in a row. In a row, two of those in grade ones uh, uh, in the Clement Hirsch and at Oakland Park in the Apple Blossom. So not she's not only a California track horse. The other one was in the Santa Margarita. Uh, for me, uh, Adair Manor has been a horse that I have voted for highly in the uh, top ten thoroughbred po poll, even uh, even before. Uh, her facing the boys in the Pacific Classic. Uh, um, yeah, she has got a terrific record. Um, she will have to stretch out to the mile and a quarter distance in the Pacific Classic for the first time. But that's true about a lot of horses in this field. Yeah, yeah, mile and a quarter is a question. But this is the Breeders' Cup Classic distance. This is the Pacific Classic distance. Adair Manor, you know, we saw Caitlin, her greatness, upset the king's plate on uh, uh on, on friday at woodbine then we saw torpedo anna just miss in the travers and now we have a dare manor in the uh, pacific classic i like these females running in big races against the males um clearly she has less to beat in the pacific classic than torpedo anna did in the uh in the travers uh clear second choice on the morning line is dr venkman dr venkman is a talented son of ghost zapper for trainer mark glatt uh matt and uh he, he was a sprinter he, he had never been uh, farther than seven furlongs he had shown some real talent in sprints but he had never been beyond seven furlongs before the san diego san diego is only a mile and 16th but uh, i tell you what he put away arabian night uh very easily in that san diego and he was a good-looking winner in his first try uh, going farther than seven furlongs last time. Yep, absolutely, Brian. Uh, um, can't argue with that. Uh, um, again, there's the mile and a quarter distance and uh, tougher field than uh, he beat in the San Diego Handicap. I don't know how much tougher, though. So uh, he's the second choice. Yeah, Dr. Vegman is a talented horse, but to go to a seven to a mile, 16 to a mile and a quarter at this level... It is a test for Dr. Bankman, the second choice. Uh, some of the others we need to talk about. Let's start with the six, the uh, third choice there on the morning line. Full Serrano is an interesting horse to me, Matt, because good horse in Argentina. He's been a mile and a quarter. He's one of those horses in the race who's been a mile and a quarter, and he's done it well. His first race in Del Mar was only an allowance race in, in, in the United States. His first race in the United States, but he went very fast early which makes me think he could take the lead of this race if he wants it. And uh, with that experience, he won that mile race, although they didn't finish real fast. But he won his first race in the United States for John Sadler. With that mile and a quarter experience, he becomes an interesting horse in this race. Yeah, uh, uh, but that first American start, he, he did it nicely with a good record coming from South America. John Sadler, I think I heard a stat, has won the Pacific class four out of the last six times. And, of course, uh, trainer Bob Baffert's won it a gazillion times. Yeah. Well, hey, I, I remember Sadler winning at least once. That's not true. I do remember him winning more. But, of course, last year, Tour de Force, uh, uh, a big, big win for Sadler. Of course, that was flight line. There's no flight line in this one, Matt. And uh, we're, 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 we're looking, I think, as the favorite, a pretty heavy favorite, is the uh, five-year-old Uncle Mo Mayor Adair Manor. Another one that interests me here is the rail, Il Miracola. I mentioned that uh, Johnny V is the best big race rider in the country these days. Mike Smith is still pretty good at these big races as well. Il Miracola has just run a lot of good races, has this multiple graded stakes winning son of gun runner for trainer Antonio Sano. Comes in a, a, a real game effort. I, I think it was even better than it looks on paper when he ran second last time at Monmouth in the Island. Yeah, Il Miracola. Uh, uh, he's a traveler, Brian. No, no older horse uh, is a better traveler than Il, Il Miracola. Uh, run it like six different tracks showing up in his past performances in recent races, second in the Islam, third in the Ali Sheba. His most recent win was a grade three ghost zapper at Gulfstream Park in March, which is uh, his home base. 
Yeah, well, he just he, he just keeps running good races. I mean, he hasn't won a lot in the, at the big stage yet, but he might have found a nice spot here. I also think he's a horse who should be just fine at a mile and a quarter. So interesting there. A little surprised that the number four, the other Baffert reincarnate, who, of course, we remember on the Derby Trail last year, is so high on the morning line. I, I think he could be lower than that, but uh, he comes off a well-beaten second last time in the mile and a half Cougar. Yeah, uh, yeah, 20 to 1 on the morning line for reincarnate for Bob Baffert. That's hard to believe. I, I, I know... Uh, uh, he's not one of uh, Baffert's uh, world beaters. But one thing for sure about Reincarnate, we know that he can get the distance. You mentioned uh, uh, that, sec that, that second place finish in the Cougar, which is a long distance. He was second in the Gold Cup, which is another long distance. Uh, fourth in the Oaklawn Handicap. Um, we know he can handle the distance. He is... 0 for 4 in terms of victories this year. Yeah, yeah, he hasn't been winning, and that's why he will have some odds as opposed to the other Baffert, but he kind of hangs around, and sometimes these mile and a quarter races, it's it's a matter of hanging around. So reincarnate, probably one you can't throw out here in, in the Pacific Classic. Let's take a look at the time form U.S. pace projector now, Matt. Uh, we see that fast pace, that red button on the upper right there. So they're projecting a fast pace, and they – Kind of agree with what I saw in his first race in America, full Serrano they had as the leader, but then a host of horses, including uh, contenders, Il Miracola, the one, Dr. Venkman, the three, and Adair Manor, the seven, all within close proximity of what could be a pretty strong pace. Who's going to rally? Uh, I, I think there are uh, possibilities in here. They have Reincarnate, who's not necessarily a big come from behind horse, a little farther off the lead. Then you got number five, Katana, and Katana is one of two for Dr Doug O'Neill. He was an improving son of Klimt last year, and he had a long layoff. And he, he was running down the stretch uh, against Dr. Venkman to be second last time in the San Diego. Another horse I don't think you can throw out here. Yeah, uh, Doug O'Neill, big races. You never know. He can uh, certainly pull uh, pull an upset. Uh, Katona, 8-1 to one on the morning line, uh, has to be looked at. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that I love the breeding for a mile and a quarter, uh, so we'll have to see. But uh, the San Diego was good. Other horses we haven't talked about all rate at least a shot in here. There goes Harvard is a grade one winner at a mile and a quarter. Uh, let's not forget that for trainer Michael McCarthy. There, there's not a lot on his recent form. I'll give you that, but the son will take charge one a mile and a quarter grade one a couple of years ago. Number eight, not above the law and nice. Cal bred. I'm not sure a mile and a quarter is what he necessarily wants, but his form has reversed of late to good good racing in his last two. And Mixto, the other O'Neill, is a son of good magic who is, despite being one of 13 in his life, he's often in the mix. No pun intended there with the name. Uh, none above the law, by the way, Matt, is one of 13 the last two years. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and Mixto, uh, yeah, the run against a lot of these horses in, in some of the big races, the Gold Cup, the Californian, uh, hit the board here and there. Yeah, it wouldn't shock me if just about anybody in this race ran well, but it looks like a Dare Manners race if she if she if she runs her best. She's she's the one to beat. Yeah, absolutely agree. All right. So we're gonna go from one mile and a quarter grade one race, million dollar grade one race. To another on the other side of the coast, back where we just were, Matt, Saratoga. It's the Jockey Club Gold Cup. I remember when this race was much longer at Belmont Park, but uh, I, I digress. Now, these days, it's a mile and a quarter at Saratoga. The defending champion is in the race, number three, Bright Future. But uh, I think we have a pretty, uh, a pretty good field of seven here, and I think we have some Breeders' Cup Classic possibilities. Or, or just about anybody in this field is a Breeders' Cup Classic possibility with a good performance here. We can start out on the outside with number seven, Arthur's Ride. Arthur's Ride has run four races this year. One bad. That was on a sloppy track at Churchill Downs where he never got near the lead. But when he did get to the lead, the other three, a Gulfstream Park allowance after a layoff to start the year. 
a huge mile and a quarter. I'll say that again, mile and a quarter allowance race at Saratoga early, earlier this uh, year. And of course, last time in the Whitney, Arthur's ride has looked really good in those three wins, Matt. Yes, absolutely. Uh, a horse that has had, has had, had his problems, uh, 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 coming along, but certainly is in the best form that he's been in his career. He's been able to put a few races together now, which is something that he couldn't do before. But I think we're going to have to talk about his Whitney victory by more than two lengths that came on a muddy and sealed track. Was that track a factor in uh, Arthur Arthur's ride's uh, performance? He certainly liked the, the, the racetrack. He's not going to get a, way, a wet track this weekend. It's supposed to be uh, beautiful weather at Saratoga, but other horses in this field were in that Whitney on that muddy track, and it may have uh, been a negative factor for them. Yeah, certainly. Like the defending champion, Bright Future, uh, who who really didn't run in the Whitney. Uh, Arthur's ride, though, I think is good on fast tracks still. So so we'll have to see. But something to think about as far as the Whitney affecting other horses in the race uh, and, and them not running as well in that Whitney. Number one should be the second choice in here, Matt. That's Tapa Trice. Tapa Trice, of course, we remember well from last year. Tapa Trice won the Tampa Bay Derby. He won the Bluegrass and uh, was involved in, in the Triple Crown all the way through. It was third in the Belmont, third at Saratoga in the Travers last year. After a layoff for trainer Todd Pletcher, he came back with a big performance in New Jersey. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there were lots of questions about Tapa Trice uh, from last year. Uh, Flash, some really good performances disappointed other times uh, how was he going to come back in 2024 well he came back big with that victory in the monmouth cup can he keep it going in the, in the jockey club gold cup yeah a mile and a quarter we, we still think is a mile and a quarter. by the way matt i think someone's knocking at your door i don't know if you want to i don't know if you want to get that hey a mile and a quarter is a distance that this horse can handle his return race was big he deserves to be the second choice in here. It'll be interesting to see if Tapa Trice is a more uh, complete, mature racehorse now as a four-year-old for Pletcher. Uh, two, Kucher has a little bit of speed for Luis Saez, who's starting to heat up at Saratoga, but he is a real long shot. Number three, Bright Future, a horse who won this race last year. I think it was a little bit lighter edition of the Jockey Club Gold Cup. Some people might disagree with me, but I, I would take this year's field over last year's field. Bright Future ran a good, uh, much like Tapa Trice, a good win for Pletcher at Monmouth in his return race. But then, uh, as we said, nothing on that wet track in the Whitney. Yep, nice win uh, at the Sal in the Salvador Mile at the Jersey Shore track. I agree with you, though, Brian. Uh, the uh, win in the Jockey Club Gold Cup for Bright, Bright Future was a little bit of a surprise, but I agree that that was a weaker field than this one. Yeah, number four is Disarm, who was also in the Whitney. He kind of had a mild rally to be fourth. Hasn't really impressed in his three starts this year, but last year he was a good second in the Travers. Uh, Disarm is a horse who may be ready to show his best at a mile and a quarter at Saratoga, where maybe he ran his career best last year. Yeah, maybe. Uh, um, this year, though, a sixth in the Stephen Foster, a fourth in the Whitney. He's going to have to get back to his best running. Yeah, a mile and a quarter could, on a fast track, could be the medicine that this arm needs. We'll see. Pyrenees is a very interesting horse because he really did come from nowhere. But this year, for trainer Sherry DeVoe, uh, Pyrenees has been very good. In, in, in fact, Matt, Pyrenees has won three out of four with the second in the other, the last two, uh, a winner, a game winner of the uh, Pimlico special going a mile and three sixteenths. And then last time, a, a decent second behind Kings Barnes in the Stephen Foster, the grade one Stephen Foster. Yeah. I was certainly impressed with that performance uh, in uh, 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 at, at Pimlico and, and the second place finish in the Foster. Cherie DeVoe has had horses ready for big races, um, this is an interesting uh, uh, horse that is 
five to one on the morning line. So third, third choice or, or higher possibly. Yeah, th that's our morning line. So we haven't seen the track morning line yet. I think there's a lot of horses that will get that to some extent, but Pyrenees off his recent form uh, deserves to be the third choice in here. Number six is another horse you can't throw out. Another horse who might really like a mile and a quarter. Highland Falls, a well-bred son of Curlin for Brad Cox, uh, was looking good after a nice stakes win at Churchill Downs, but then failed last time against Tapit Trice as Tapit Trice just overpowered him in the Monmouth Cup. Yeah, uh, this is a Brad Cox, and so uh, you know that a Brad Cox horse is going to take money uh, in in a race like this. Um, was second in the Oaklawn Handicap, a grade two earlier in the year. Won the blame, a grade three at Churchill Downs, and second in that Monmouth Cup. Um, certainly a horse that can't be discounted in here, um, but it, it reminds me how impressive Tappet Trice was in that Monmouth Cup victory. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of both for me. I, I think Highland Falls didn't run his absolute best and could bounce back here. But yeah, Tapit Trace did run a big return race at Monmouth. Let's take a look at this time form US pace projector for the Jackie Club Gold Cup, Matt. And uh, part of the story for me, at least, it, it, it is what we see here. Um, I don't think anybody has the speed of Arthur's ride. There, there's horses in here with a little bit of tactical speed, several horses with a little bit of tactical speed. The long shot Kucher, uh, Highland Falls, Pyrenees, uh, e even Bright Future has some tactical speed. Tapit Trice stayed a little closer in his first race in a long time last time. But uh, Arthur's ride is the speed of this race. Oh, no doubt, Brian. And and he's going to get out front. Junior Alvarado did it uh, in the Whitney. I think there's little question that he's going to do it again. But the question is, can he carry that uh, speed for a mile and a quarter? Yeah, um, I, I think he's the type of horse that likes to be free running on the front. And, and I think the fact that there's no real speed in here, it's going to set up pretty nicely for him. And, and on that, Let's get to our top pick in these big mile and a quarter grade one million dollar races leading up to the Breeders' Cup Classic, Matt Schiffman. Who do you like? Let's do the West Coast first with the Pacific Classic. Certainly. Let's start with the uh, Pacific Classic. I talked about it earlier that this is a race where I think there's only two horses that have run at a mile and a quarter. And one of them is that South American Invader for for John Sadler. The other one is reincarnate. I don't know, Brian, uh, getting that distance isn't easy. Uh, a Bafford horse at a big price. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go with reincarnate and say, uh, um, maybe he's the one that's going to get the distance. Yeah. They're not the only ones that have run a mile and a quarter before, but uh, I'm, I'm actually going to go with a horse who hasn't run a mile and a quarter before because I think he'll like a mile and a quarter. His name is Il Miracola. Hey, listen, Adair Manor, the mare, the female running against the boys, she's the one to beat. But I think I think she's going to be odds on in here. Last week, my most likely winner of the Traverse was Torpedo Anna. People ask me why I didn't pick her first because of the odds, because of the value. Sometimes you have to look for value. Um Adair Manor at four to five. Yeah, she's 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 got a great shot to win. But I've seen her kind of struggle. Black Eyed Susan was over two years ago. Uh, last year's Breeders' Cup Distaff, though, was not all that long ago. And, and she did not finish off those races when she had to work as well. She might be just better than ever and might run them off the feet. But Il Miracola, bred to go long, keeps running good races, has the ability to stay in touch early and finish races as well. I'm going to go with Il Miracola as uh, my upset pick in the Pacific Classic. Two upset picks for, for us there, Matt. How about the Jockey Club Gold Cup? Uh, Brian, um, after I saw uh, Tapa Trice come back and run that race at Monmouth Park in the Monmouth Cup, I, I, I made a mental note of it. I've tried not to forget about that performance because it's easy to – to forget about some of these big performances when there's so much going on in, in racing. I was impressed that Tapit Trice maybe has turned the corner and, and this is 
and will fulfill the expectations that we saw from last year. I know Arthur's ride is the horse to beat. I know he's going to be out front, but you know what? Uh, I'm going to take a little bit of a better price with Tapatrice from the barn of Todd Pletcher, uh, who's been winning big races. Yeah, well, he just won the Travers, so I, I, I guess that would be a big race. Tapatrice was a money burner last year, and uh, I, 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 I'm afraid he's still a money burner. We'll see, though. Sometimes horses come back as older horses and are just better. So Tapatrice has a sh shot in here, but Arthur's ride, when he gets the lead, I think he's just a really, really nice horse, and I don't see any reason why he's not on the lead here. Uh, his mile and a quarter race over a fast track at the distance of the Jockey Club Gold Club at Saratoga was one of the races of the meet there. Uh, he ran a huge race in that allowance race at a mile and a quarter. Put him on the lead, and, and I just don't think he gets beat here. He's my pick uh, in the Jockey Club Gold Club. Matt, we talked about a lot. Travers. Breeders' Cup Classic previews in the, in the Pacific Classic and the Jockey Club. Thank you for doing what you do every single week. Let me get a parting shot from you, my friend. You are welcome, Brian Zipsy. Uh, right back at you. Right back at all of the Horse Center fans who are back with us also. Uh, uh, Brian and I met some really nice people at Saratoga. Uh, uh, when we were up there, nice people that are Horse Center fans. Thank you for saying hello, as we always do. And thanks for watching the show. Yeah, we enjoyed meeting so many nice people at Saratoga last weekend. At, uh, tune in to Horse Center. Matt and I are honored that you do. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel here at Horse Racing Nation, go ahead, do that now. Turn on the notifications. Leave us a comment, even if it's telling us that we're a couple of boneheads. We don't mind. Uh, also, special thanks to, of course, our friend in the home office, Candace Curtis, for the race graphics. Time form US for the pace projections we use almost every single week. And of course, our sponsor, Derby Wars, the best contest site out there. Until next week, when we have a lot more to talk about here on Horse Center, good luck, folks. Have a great week. We'll see you right here next week on Horse.